Alfred Nobel was a Swedish chemist, engineer, and inventor who earned his fame and wealth from the development and manufacture of armaments, most notably dynamite. In 1888, he was shocked to read his own obituary, which had been printed by French newspapers. The papers had mistakenly identified his brother Ludwig, who had died in Keynes, for Alfred. This premature obituary was a celebration of his death and condemnation of his life and dangerous inventions. The headline proclaimed, The Merchant of Death is Dead. This early vision of his death made Alfred concerned about how he would be remembered by history. Eight years later, upon his death, it was discovered to much amazement that his final will requested that his great wealth be put towards the creation of a series of prizes for those who had conferred the greatest benefit on mankind in the fields of physics, chemistry, peace, medicine, and literature. Since its origination, this Nobel Prize had been awarded to 813 individuals and 20 organizations. These are the stories of these great minds. These are their contributions to mankind. These are the Laureates. The first Nobel Prize in Physics went to a German scientist named William Conrad Rentgen. William Rentgen was born on March 27, 1845 to a textiles manufacturer in the Lower Rhine province of Germany. When he was three, his family moved to Appledorn in the Netherlands. There he attended the Institute of Martinus Hermann van Dorn. He demonstrated no special skills during his time there, but was very fond of nature, often meandering about the woodlands. In 1862, he moved to Utrecht to attend a technical school. He was expelled, however, due to being wrongly accused of drawing an offensive caricature of a teacher. In 1865, he enrolled at the Polytechnic in Zurich as a student of mechanical engineering, graduating Ph.D. in 1869. It was the late 1800s. In America, Mark Twain was calling it the Gilded Era as a criticism of the disparity between rich and poor. But in Europe, it was the gay 90s, a time of merriment and cultural advancement. The first standardized car, the Benz Velo, was released in Germany, allowing motorists to zip about cities, which were growing rapidly due to the second industrial revolution. Scientific advancement inspired authors. H.G. Wells published The War of the Worlds and The Time Machine. The Lumiere brothers, with their lightweight cameras, were capturing the motion and excitement of this time. Impressionists, too, were creating images of the modern world. The Impressionists carefully depicted the behavior of light with thin but visible brushstrokes and saturated colors. While artists were studying light in this way, scientists were also studying light. In 1887, Heinrich Hertz discovered the photoelectric effect, the same year that the michelson morley experiment showed the speed of light to be a constant. Rentgen also studied light, among other things. He conducted experiments with the relationship of pressure to the bending of light passing through fluids. He also studied the ability of electromagnetism to influence planes of polarized light. But his greatest contribution to science would come when he began to work with vacuum tubes. In his research, Rentgen worked with a Crookes tube, an early version of the cathode ray tubes used in older televisions and monitors. It was powered by a Ruhmkorff coil more commonly known as an induction coil. In an induction coil, power comes from a low voltage DC supply, in this case a battery. The charge flows through an iron core wrapped in two layers of bundled copper wire. This current generates an electromagnetic field. The magnetism attracts a metal arm called the interrupter. This breaks the current causing the magnetic field to collapse. With the magnetism gone, a spring flips the interrupter back into place, thereby reconnecting the circuit and re-engaging the magnetic field. This cycle repeats many hundreds of times per second with each collapse of the magnetic field, generating a high-voltage electric pulse. 
With the voltage being stepped up by the induction coil, the power supply is now high enough tension to power the Crookes tube. When the tube is turned on, residual air molecules are charged by the electric current. They are attracted to the negatively charged cathode at the back of the tube. These air particles collide with the cathode with enough force that it releases electrons. Being negatively charged as well, the electrons are repelled by the cathode and drawn toward the positively charged anode. They accelerate rapidly towards the anode. Because of their minimal mass, in the short trip across the tube, the electrons approach one-fifth the speed of light. Once they pass the anode, they have built up so much momentum that they are unable to stop before colliding with the far end of the tube. This collision causes the electrons in the glass to vibrate, creating fluorescence. In 1895, Rentgen was experimenting with the effects of vacuum tubes on external objects. He had previously noted that a Lennard vacuum tube could create a fluorescent effect in barium platinocyanide, even when blocked by a sheet of cardboard. He suspected that a Crookes tube, despite its thicker glass, could have a similar effect. In the afternoon of November 5, 1895, William Rentgen prepared to test his theory. He crafted a box out of black cardboard and placed it over his Crookes tube. Before conducting his experiment, he turned off the lights to confirm that his cardboard covering was light tight. Confident that it was indeed blocking out all visible light emitted by the tube, he turned to switch the lights back on. But as he did so, he noted a faint shimmering several feet from his setup. He repeatedly switched the Crookes tube on and off to ensure that the shimmering and the function of the tube were related. He then struck a match and saw that the source of the shimmer was the barium platinocyanide screen he had planned to test. His theory was confirmed before his experiment was even entirely prepared. He knew that his covering would block out visible light and ultraviolet radiation. So there must have been some form of radiation passing through the cardboard causing the screen to fluoresce, a type of radiation as of yet unknown. The new form of radiation discovered in 1896 by William Rentgen would bear his name in most languages, but English would keep the nomenclature Rentgen himself preferred, X-rays or X-radiation, named following the mathematical tradition using X to denote something unknown. So what was this unknown? Just what had Rentgen discovered? X-rays are more energetic than ultraviolet rays, but less energetic than gamma rays, which were in Rentgen's time yet to be discovered. At the low energy end, X-rays are distinct from ultraviolet rays in that they are ionizing. When a photon collides with an atom, it vibrates the electrons, causing them to release more photons. When this occurs with enough energy, the electron is vibrated so intensely that it is freed from the atom, making the atom an ion. X-rays can do this, ultraviolet rays cannot. At the high energy end, the distinction between X-rays and gamma rays is their source within the atom. X-rays, like most electromagnetic waves, are generated by the vibrating of electrons. Gamma rays are generated by the vibrating of atomic nuclei. Earlier scientists had conducted experiments with X-rays. But William Rentgen is generally accredited with their discovery because of his thorough analysis of the properties and behavior of X-rays. After discovering the ability of X-rays to pass through cardboard, he diligently and eagerly studied what could and could not be penetrated by X-rays. So excited was he by his discovery that for weeks he slept and ate in his laboratory while conducting meticulous experiments. We soon discover that all bodies are transparent to this agent though in very different degrees. I proceed to give a few examples. Paper is very transparent. Behind a bound book of about 1,000 pages, I saw the fluorescent screen light up brightly, the printer's ink offering scarcely a noticeable hindrance. In the same way, the fluorescence appeared behind a double pack of cards. A single card held between the apparatus and the screen being almost unnoticeable to the human eye. A single sheet of tinfoil is also scarcely perceptible. It is only after several layers have been placed over one another that their shadow is distinctly seen on the screen. Thick blocks of wood are also transparent, pine boards two or three centimeters thick absorbing only slightly. 
a plate of aluminium, about 15 millimeters thick, though it enfeebled the action seriously, did not cause the fluorescence to disappear entirely. Sheets of hard rubber, several centimeters thick, still permit the rays to pass through them. Glass plates of equal thickness behave quite differently according as they contain lead or not. The former are much less transparent than the latter. If the hand be held between the discharge tube and the screen, the darker shadow of the bones is seen within the slightly dark shadow image of the hand itself. It was this property of the X-ray, its ability to penetrate objects based on their density, which made it so visually exciting. It was while holding a piece of lead in front of the screen that Rentgen first noticed his skeleton appearing in the shadow. After this discovery, he continued his research in secret, fearing that his observation may be mistaken or that colleagues would not believe his remarkable claims. He soon found that photographic plates were sensitive to the X-rays, thereby enabling him to document the shadow images he'd been seeing. His first X-ray print was of his wife's hand. Her bones could be seen within the translucent outline of her hand, but darkest of all were her wedding bands. She is recorded to have exclaimed upon seeing the X-ray image of her hand, I have seen my death. Since their discovery, X-rays have become an indispensable part of our modern life, most notably in the medical field. Gone are the days of gruesome invasive exploratory surgeries as we can now use X-ray photography in a way not too unlike Rentgen's first print to identify broken bones, digestive obstructions, and lung diseases. In more modern medicine, X-ray computer tomography, also known as a CT scan, has enabled us to not only view the inside of the body, but to render it as a three-dimensional map of density. The device called a fluoroscope does essentially the same thing as Rentgen's original setup. Fluoroscopy enables physicians to view the inside of the body in real time by projecting the X-ray shadow onto a screen. The power of x-rays has also served as an inspiration to the arts. Several fine art photographers have utilized x-rays as an alternative approach to image making. Stephen M. Meyer's prints use the penetrating abilities of x-rays to bring out the wispy internal venous structures of plants. Nick Vesey's fine art x-rays cover a wide range of subjects, from seashells and insects to toys and clothing. He works on a large scale, doing x-rays of full figures and vehicles. He is even responsible for what is thought to be the largest x-ray image ever created, an entire Boeing 777 jet. Peter Dazzley uses recoloring and dynamic positioning to counteract the associations of death and dysfunction created by the skeletal figures and exposed internal mechanisms shown in his work. He creates emotionally powerful images, which many people may not expect from a typically scientific process. Beyond the creation of art images themselves, x-rays have also served a functional role in the arts. An x-ray scan of a painting can be used to verify its authenticity. Many painters recycled their canvases, painting new images over rejected ones. A lack of failed sketches or rejected paintings would be a tell to an art historian that an image is a duplicate. One example is that of Van Gogh's patch of grass, which was confirmed to be authentic when an x-ray revealed an older portrait of a woman underneath. Most people likely know X-ray imaging best because of its use in airport security. The radiation easily moves through common items like clothes, paper, and the luggage itself, but will be blocked by anything metal and potentially suspicious. The technique of X-ray crystallography uses the refraction or bending of X-rays to determine the structure of a molecule. It was most famously used to determine the double helix structure of the DNA molecule, a discovery which led to Francis Crick and James Watson receiving the 1962 Nobel Prize for Chemistry. Riccardo Gianconi, another Nobel laureate, owes his success to William Rentgen. He was awarded the 2002 Nobel Prize in Physics for his work engineering the equipment for X-ray astronomy. 
X-ray astronomy uses space-based telescopes which detect X-rays rather than visible light. This allows us to detect celestial bodies and structures which we could not otherwise see. Though they knew not yet of these applications, the Nobel Foundation clearly saw the potential in X-rays. In 1901, they awarded Rentgen the first Nobel Prize in Physics. In recognition of the extraordinary services he has rendered by the discovery of the remarkable rays subsequently named after him as the official prize motivation decrees. Despite the enormous honor of being the very first Nobel laureate, Rentgen remained surprisingly humble. He refused to patent his process because he felt that the benefits should belong to all of mankind. He donated the money he was awarded to the University of Munich. Rentgen died on February 10, 1923, of a malignant tumor in his intestine. It is, however, unlikely that this was a result of his work with radiation, as he conducted those investigations only briefly and, unlike other researchers of his time, regularly used protective lead shields. In his will, he requested that his personal and scientific correspondences be destroyed upon his death. This destruction was carried out. Despite having no children of his own, Rentgen's name lives on. In many languages, x-rays were named after Rentgen, though he himself found such a naming too prideful. In Hamburg, Germany, the Philips Medical System Diagnostic Radiography and Research Development Division is located on Rentgen Street, Röntgenstrasse in German. In 2004, the International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry named the 111th element Röntgenium in his honor. <laughs>